Okay, everyone, thank you so much for being here tonight or this afternoon. Um, I'll make a very brief introduction. Um, as executive director and on behalf of RU, I'm really thrilled that we are co-hosting today's new Renaissance in Feminist Art panel with the Polish Cultural Institute in New York. RU and the Polish Cultural Institute have a long standing relationship, including hosting residencies for many Polish artists over the years. And I'm particularly grateful to Isabella Gola, Curator of Visual Arts and Design at PCI for her relentless work in shaping a series of events devoted to key issues. Isabella will now introduce our distinguished speakers and moderator. And please note that this discussion will be followed by Q&A. And if you want to type in your questions in the chat section directly, that will be very, very helpful. Thank you so much. Natalie, thank you so much for your warm introduction and thank you everyone for joining. This conversation was organized to celebrate Women's History Month and will examine the idea of the body as means of empowerment, confronting the normative art historical narratives through a rather two contrasting, as we will see, artistic methods and visual languages. We are very grateful to have our three panelists today, very inspiring women and renowned artists to contribute um, their valuable voices. And I'm going to go ahead and introduce um, Rotem Reshev, who is a process-based action painter and installation artist based in New York and Tel Aviv, who creates paintings and large scale immersive installations that claim the gestural painting style and the uh, they are guided by her method and actions of bodily gestures, often reusing waste from the studio activity. Um, Rotem have been shown internationally in solo and group exhibitions. And just before the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, she had a solo exhibition titled Arcadia at the Katona Museum of Art. Rotem graduated from uh, Hamid Rasha the School of Art in Israel. I hope I didn't mispronounce that. Very good. And, uh, and uh, has a master's degree in museum studies for the Rainward Academy in, master, uh, in Amsterdam. Uh, in her work, Rotem takes uh, neglected materials and gives them second life cycle by fossilizing them into her painting. Her immersive installations create a world for the viewer to engage with, echoing ecological and political concerns in direct and abstracted ways. And I have the pleasure now to introduce Anna Orbachevska, our second speaker for today, who is represented by the Local 30 Gallery in Warsaw and works primarily with drawing, painting and ceramics through which she conveys figurative narratives with difficult and uncomfortable messages that are often pushed under the rug in many communities and domestic places. Anna graduated from the Royal Academy of Fine Arts in The Hague in 1998, and a year later um, from the Academy of Fine Arts in Gdańsk. Orbachevska has repeatedly received the cultural scholarship of the city of Gdańsk and the scholarship of the Marshal of the Pomeranian Voivodeship for creators of culture. She's also the laureate of the Polish Culture in World Program of the Adam Mickiewicz Institute in both 2018 and 2020, as well as the Bremen Kunst Scholarship. And her work is in many collections, including uh, the National Museum in Gdańsk collection. And I have the big pleasure to introduce our moderator for today, Shital Prajapati, who is the interim managing director at Common Fields and works as an art advisor through her agency of Lohar projects, focusing on public engagement and organizational strategy. She serves on faculty as the School of Visual Arts in the MFA Fine Arts Program and is the board chair of Art and Feminism. 
Shital received her MA in Arts Administration Policy from the School of Art Institute of Chicago and Bachelors of Arts from Northwestern University in History and Gender Studies. To the audience, uh, everyone who joined, thank you so much. Uh, please uh, submit the questions through chat as uh, uh, the conversation unfolds. And without further ado, I would love to give the floor to Rotem Rashev. Hi, everyone. I'm very happy to be with you today. And let me share my screen. Okay. Sorry. So first, I would like to add that I'm also an artist in residence at uh, Residency Unlimited in uh, Brooklyn, uh, which is, of course, uh, part of the event. Um, as Isabella, Isabella mentioned, I'm a process-based painter and installation artist, often working on very large formats on a scale that is traditionally identified with male artists. Uh, Large-scale creations are considered ambitious and ambitions are often affiliated with men. Yet I believe that being a woman artist and working in these scales is a feminist statement by itself. And I intentionally want to occupy spaces that are traditionally and to this day given to men. In my practice as an artist and as an activist, I aspire not to be quiet and not to be silenced, but to make a statement, to take a position and to make space for myself and others. I'm an action painter and my body plays an important role in the creation process and at times as part of the final artwork. Although my work tends to be mainly abstract, my body sometimes enters the paintings and becomes the heart of the composition. I would like to quickly share three of my main sources of artistic inspiration. Helen Frankenthaler, who was staining her large canvases, creating open color fields one could dive into. Sam Gilliam, who has been painting in untraditional formats for decades. And Katharina Gross, whose large scale installations are stepping out of the conventional boundaries of exhibition space and format. I identify with all three who challenge the medium of painting and with the ways they activate the viewing experience. Like them, I aspire to create a similar experience to extend my body's activity in the studio into the exhibition space. The outcome is often not a painting that is installed to be admired, but to be immersed in. My environments of painting, and most recently of sound, invite the visitors to be surrounded by an overlapping experience that overtakes their territory and works on their senses. The viewers are not confronted by a single painting that they need to analyze or understand, but on the contrary, they are being hugged by the paintings and surrounded by long scrolls of canvases interacting on an emotional level. This form of presentation reduces the hierarchy between the viewer and the artist or the artwork. I believe it brings a more humble approach of equality and togetherness, ideas that have to do with compassion, healing, and nursing, qualities that are often being perceived as feminine or, or practiced naturally by women. Uh, wait. wait. Mm. I have been politically and socially active for many years, but for most of my career, I chose to leave my activism out of the studio. I wanted to protect my art from the roughness of the outside world. Although I did make some paintings that in the past that dealt with political ideas, these were singular examples. Uh, only since 2017, I slowly started shifting my approach and began creating installations that center around topics as global warming and climate change in Time Traveler, the migration crisis, 
and lack of political leadership in Time Traveler Part 2, Compass. And experiencing the cycle of life and death through the nature that surrounds us in Arcadia. Arcadia, my solo exhibition at the Katona Museum of Art, also served as the contemporary continuation of the group exhibition Sparkling Amazons, following abstract expressionist women artists that was shown at the same time at the museum. In the last few years, Israel's political system has been shaken. We just ended the fourth cycle of elections, and just like in the US and around the world, a major part of the protests in Israel is being led by women. Um, as an artist and activist, I led a weekly protest at the center of Tel Aviv and found myself painting sites in my studio on the same surface where I make my paintings while using some of the paints and brushes from my studio. The junction where the protest took place became an immersive environment in itself, not letting the public avoid our message and call for action. In 2019, I exhibited Eden in two acts, a public art project in two parts. I enlarged two details from an enormous painting installation that is responding to the history of the state of Israel, the dreams that were associated with it in the beginning and the reality of life thereafter. This wall mural was installed in, on the facade of the artist house in Tel Aviv. Its first part is aspired to encourage people to go out and vote, showing two threatening bloody stains overshadowing branches of vegetation. The second part wished to bring some cleansing and healing with the calmness of an underwater feeling. More recently, towards the end of 2020, I created the site-specific installation, A Heartfelt Event. It was painted and installed while the COVID-19 pandemic was on the rise and the, the end of it was not to be seen. It alluded to chambers of the heart surrounded by nature through three dedicated spaces made of painting and sound. The audio pieces combined heartbeats and birds singing alongside recordings of drums I took in the demonstrations in Jerusalem during the past year. The installation created a microcosm that was both intimate and public, giving a sense of marching in the streets, but also in the narrow corridor or corridors of life, when we have no perspective as to what awaits behind the corner or where it all leads to. Please have a look at the short video from the exhibition.
uh, following the Me Too movement that brought the voices of women to the front, I decided to bring the female figure to the front of my canvases and created a series I called Mysteries, which stands for both mysteries as in Greek mythology, but also sounds somewhat like my stories. By using materials that already have their history and stories, I created paintings that resemble ghostly portraits connecting between the women of today and the spirits of the women that marched and protested before us. And I would like to end this presentation with Habitat, my most body-oriented series that grew naturally from the mystery series. I was working on another exhibition titled Mom, Dad, Me, that reflected on my family's roots, memories, and connections with the history of Israel. The first three Habitat paintings that were made for that show centered on an inseparable connection between the figures in my family, nature, and landscaping they developed around them. The figures in this series, mostly me, represent an unrecognizable female body that is connected with twigs and branches to mother nature, to plants, to growing, to birth and rebirth, to the cycle of life and death. It is standing in midair or lying on the ground, protects the land like a scarecrow or fly, fly above it. And it brings a very clear statement that I am and we are here to stay. This body is not going anywhere. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rotem. And I would love to give the floor now to Anna Orbachevska. Thank you for being here, Anna. Hello, everybody. I'm also very happy to be a part uh, of this panel. Thank you for inviting me. So I will share my presentation. Now, if you can see it. Yes. Uh, I focus my presentation upon the idea of, uh, of the body. All my works are very connected with, uh, with my life. I very often use the image of my body in works to manifest specific idea, ideas and problems. I'm uh, showing here two of my works from the series uh, Dejane Pets. Uh, and uh, this image contains a very popular prayer from a Catholic church uh, here on this pink, pink uh, uh, colors it's uh, written and it's uh, the title was Gua guardian angel and uh, it's saying it says guardian angel may you always stand by me and protect me from all the what is bad and uh, for me it's like uh, my guardian angel protect uh, keep me away from me and make sure I do not speak and hear too much. In this painting installation, I refer to the form of, of, uh, of altar. This is the second painting from the series. In this painting, uh, I compare the situation of a woman to that of a domestic pet who is not having all the rights in the family, who is a minor member of the family, not really equal. This series of works is about how to desire to fulfill other people's, mainly male, expectation, causes us to be paralyzed. These are uh, the expectation arising from the patriarchal view of the world uh, that define us as women, as we should be in order to be feminine, in order to be a real woman. I, ex I have experienced that uh, myself a lot in my life. Uh, this is how I was brought up. These works are about these feelings, about these emotions that have accompanied me for most of my life. Pressure to be perceived as a good, uh, as a real woman came, as, uh, came out first and uh, keep my needs, uh, keep my, uh, kill my uh, deep needs uh, as an individual. Uh, a great fear kept me from changing it. This, uh, this is a work I don't always do what I feel like doing. 
I started drawing intensively in 2011 um, from the moment when I went for the artist residency staying in Bremen. I did not plan to draw at all. I wanted to paint um, different uh, paintings and uh, most of these images were coming to me when I was uh, ex um, experiencing, experiencing something, when I was thinking about some problems uh, that, which evokes a specific emotions. Actually, I could not get rid of these uh, images. I uh, had to draw them and I didn't like it myself so much. It was too, uh, too much confronting. And uh, for most of my childhood and adolescence, I live in uh, what psychologists refer to dissociation. I was completely disconnected from my body, from my intuition. So in fact, I, I didn't know who I am. And to find uh, really myself, I, uh, I was talking to myself and uh, pictures. It, uh, it was not really pleasant because uh, I had to first and confront things which I wanted in fact to uh, run away. But it was true. Um, and previously, I painted pictures uh, when uh, I only suggest some tension, some, some unrest, but they were not as confronting as those drawings. I could still hide uh, behind them. For a really long time, I kept those drawings for myself. And then that was the first time in uh, 2015, uh, I showed them to a wider public in my studio. I was looking for a pictogram to, for my emotional stain to, to, to name them uh, sometimes because I did them quite fast. So I, I, I was also writing on them and uh, this is, I have nothing to lose because all these parts are apart me. And this one, it's called Niezręczna. I don't know if I would translate it. It's uh, awkward, but in Polish language, it means also without hands. It's another drawing from the family life. Very often, in order to feel and to understand a problem that is important to me, I refer to my body, how I perceive it in my body. And that's why this deformation. Often when I think about something that is beyond me, that scares me, or uh, uh, my hands, I feel like my hands are getting bigger until I, have, I can hardly move and then I draw it. And this is a drawing about called First Start about Christmas. Uh, I, I hate Christmas. It's, it's how I feel always like, like paralyzed, like I cannot move from all these expectations. No, sorry. This is drawing about uh, motherhood. And uh, Polish mother is holy. It's, an, it's, a, it's even a sentence, Polish mother, and it's, 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 fun, it's, it's, it's vivid in, in, in Poland, in, in the language. Polish mother, she is always calm and happy and caring, and she's ne never put her needs first. She never wants anything for herself, and she's silent. Of course, Polish mother is, are, are better than the others. There's no other uh, better mother than Polish mother. <laughs> And I was not really fitting to that image. It's, it's, it may be funny to hear it, but such uh, unwritten beliefs are really present in, in, in Poland. And of course, uh, men decide what is appreciated, what is good for Polish mothers. I drew this drawing thinking about tidying the abortion law in Poland. This is flag design for 100th uh, anniversary of gaining voting rights by Polish, by, by women in Poland. These two drawings are included in the collection of NOMUS New Museum of Art, a branch of National Museum in Gdańsk. 
I made a series of drawings inspired uh, by the novels of Gintergrass and Kashubia, which is an area around Gdańsk. And I focus on the situations of women. And this is the symbol, this flower of, 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 of Kashubia. In order to, uh, for the content I'm talking about to be more noticed, I decided to put it on a play. I have always been fascinated by the services and tableware of beautiful porcelain, which is, are the pride of very good middle-class families. I refer to this decoration, but my works also, they look uh, very aesthetic from the distance. Uh, they are meant. They are. They are, uh, they are meant to confront and uh, with unpleasant topic rather than decorate. The drawings are permanent. I bag those porcelain and uh, plates in a ceramic clean oven. Uh, I did not want to create a specific nice looking aesthetic object, but just a plate that you can use every day. You can. Uh, serve steaks and potatoes and salad for your family and use it uh, uh, for your uh, dinner. <laughs> uh, this is an exhibition view, uh, a breakfast set at the exhibition I'm about to go berserk, created by Agnieszka Reizacher at Local, uh, Local 30 in uh, 2019. And the exhibition was opening Warsaw Gallery Weekend. Some close up from exhibition wall, breakfast. Uh, this is a dinner set and uh, exhibition uh, Femino at Gdansk City Gallery, created by Marta Wrublewska, Ivana Denko, and Renata Kopytko. Another part of this. In these works, I refer to old Dutch tiles. Uh, they were brought to Poland from the Netherlands by ships from the middle of 18th century. They were beautiful decoration for rich bourgeois and aristocrats' houses here in Poland and Pomerania, where I live. These uh, tiles came on ships as ballast uh, and were later traded here for uh, various goods. I like the idea of ballast because I'm also talking about ballast. Uh, I made them myself. I made 140 of them in the old traditional Mayolika technique, which was uh, also used in 18th century in the Netherlands. I uh, use identical or similar ornaments. Uh, they look uh, like beautiful decoration from the distance, but when you come closer, you might be confirmed, <laughs> then it's a little bit strange. Uh, I, yeah, I like to go through these crafts myself. I like crafts, so I, I really wanted to make a beautiful object, but then uh, saying something more than only beauty. These are a uh, photo from exhibition. I do not want uh, called, I do not know, how I should tell this, in Bevoa Zielona Góra in 2020, uh, uh, the curator was uh, Aneta Szyłak. It's really nice cooperation. And uh, I present uh, there also for the first time uh, two paintings from the new series where I refer to Baroque masterpieces of European paintings. And from uh, I re-edit re this historic work, uh, this works in uh, painting by inverting uh, colors. Um, uh, I made them negative, and uh, it uh, it is a symbolic procedure. Uh, I wanted to show another uh, side of this uh, nice, lovely images, and but still they look nice from from the distance. And when you come closer, you see this lens uh, uh, with, a, with a drawing I put. And here is the work uh, um, made by, uh, I was inspired by the painting uh, 
uh, by Fragonard called Family. And uh, previously, uh, on the uh, on the original version, there was a, a small boy uh, instead of this penis. Uh, and all these women were so happy that it's a boy. And so that was also reminding me my situation from my uh, my house. And uh, for example, when I deliver my first son, my grandmother came and she came and said, oh, are you happy, Anya, that it's not a girl? And uh, it's uh, still uh, present, all those beliefs. And uh, yeah, when I was making my uh, first exhibition, also a female curator, she came, I, I was pregnant and she, I knew already that it will be a boy. And she also was, oh, what's, what's, uh, what, it's so nice that it's gonna be a boy. And yeah, I'm sick of it, of this beliefs and they are really present and this is a show um, yeah, previous uh, previous picture it was made by I was uh, inspired by uh, Bouchard and these two works I I exhibit at local 30 uh, 2020 uh, for the exhibition Kamel never forgets uh, also created uh, by Agnieszka Reizacher. Uh, it hurt me. This is a small size painting uh, referred to uh, to my drawings. I made uh, a lot of them, but I chose few for this presentation. Red is an expensive color and victory. And again, motherhood. And last slide, motherhood. Thank you. That's the end. Thank you so much, Anna. It was very uh, comprehensive presentation. And um, I would love to give the floor to Sheetal Prajapati, who is our moderator, and then the discussion will follow. Here we go. Great. Okay. All right. Um, thank you, everyone. Um, thank you to Residency Unlimited and to the Polish Cultural Institute for the invitation and very happy to be in conversation with Rotem and Anna. Um, it was wonderful to hear about both of your work in, in this in this presentation. Um, so I'm actually going to talk a little bit about my practice outside of the studio. I am an artist and I do have a creative practice. But when the three of us were talking about this panel, um, it felt like Rotem and Anna's work really addressed a, a wide range of ideas around the way feminism can be explored, shared, and kind of presented through an an artistic practice that uh, intersects with activism as well. And I thought that I might share a little bit about my work in the field as a administrator, a curator, an organizer, and a consultant, and talk a little bit about the role that feminism or my feminist practice, the way it's been embedded in some of that work throughout my career. And I consider this approach that I take to the work that I do to be a feminist approach, to be an inclusive approach, and to be one that is really about moving the needle forward for women in our field at a wide range of levels. So I started my career in museum education as a museum educator. I've worked at um, museums and art institutions in full-time capacity for about 16 years. And in this work, um, you know, oftentimes museum education is the space where you are bringing in more people of color, you are bringing in more marginalized, com marginalized communities in the spaces that you live in. So I think from early in my work in the field, I was really interested in and cared about the way that museums could provide access to different kinds of audiences. And early in my career, that was a wide range of people that I kind of observed that weren't coming to the museum. Um, but as I kind of moved through the work, I realized that it's not only about creating spaces that engage more inclusive audiences, but there's a lot going on 
internally in, in art institutions that promote the patriarchy, that keep women and other marginalized groups of people out of positions of leadership, or exclude them from access to opportunities for a variety of reasons. And so I think over time, um, especially working in large institutions and small institutions, I worked at MoMA, I've worked at a University Museum, I also worked at non-collecting institutions like Pioneer Works in Brooklyn. Um, in all of these spaces, I observed that, you know, there was a lot of room to move forward and to think about how I can make decisions as someone that was a director, as a manager of folks and other people to create, to start creating a different kind of culture internally. And the, a lot of my work was very focused on this aspect of museum work that's called public engagement. And in 2019, I decided to start working independently. And part of the reason that I decided to do this is because I realized that as I was working in institutions and doing a lot of work in terms of creating fellowships for diverse candidates, prioritizing the hiring of women, helping create policies that were more inclusive, all of that work was really interesting to me, but I found myself a little bit of a barrier at some of the places I was working because I felt like the content I was being given from the curatorial team wasn't content that I was really interested in trying to put out in public because I felt like it wasn't as relevant to maybe some of the audiences I was interested in. Now, this is my personal choice. And I think that is kind of what led me into a more independent space where I realized that equity, be, equity, intersectionality and inclusion were embedded in the work that I was doing and that I wanted to put those forward in my practice. And one of the first big projects I was able to work on in this space was um, we're doing all of the public engagement for uh, a, a sculpture by Kahinde Wiley that was installed in Times Square in 2019. And the, the sculpture you can see here in this image, it's called Rumors of War. And when Times Square approached me about working with them, we started talking about this artwork. And Kehinde Wiley made this uh, sculpture fashioned after a Confederate monument um, that's in Richmond, Virginia. And Kehinde's work is a direct response to that Confederate history that exists in our public spaces in the United States today. And this monument that he created that was originally installed in Times Square is a, a young black man sitting on top of this horse wearing jeans and a hoodie and sneakers and really doesn't look like a figure that you would expect to see on a monument. And I was really interested in the way that this work was a reclamation and a, a reclaiming of power that didn't wasn't previously accessible to an entire community of people. And just this visual representation of that in public space was so powerful. And this made me very excited about what is it that art can actually do and how can we use art and engage with art in a way that actually creates space for open dialogues for people to, to bring people in, to bring people into the conversation. And I felt like this project was a way to talk about history, to talk about politics, to talk about um, intersectionality in a really interesting way around the history of this particular country. And um, so in this work, one of the things that I did that I felt most excited about was I put together a team of public ambassadors that spoke multiple languages that would stand out in Times Square and talk to people about this work, ask them questions, what they thought, and they had a whole set of tools to have conversations. And as we were putting this team together, um, we had you know, some obvious candidates, educators, artists that were from the field. We knew they would be great. But as we started thinking about this particular space, we realized that these folks, they're experts in engagement, but Times Square is a completely, incredibly vast and diverse space. And in working with the organization, we realized that the people who knew this space best and knew engagement in this space best were the security team and the sanitation team. And so we brought a, um, a group of them onto our interpretation team and they worked with our artists and they worked with our educators to help us create a space in this very public and chaotic plaza to have intimate conversations with people, to meet them where they were, to help, help approach them in a way that made them be open to a dialogue about really complex issues. 
And this was that project kind of led to my consulting work, which is what I do now um, through my um, through Lohar projects. And this is a space where I've been able to choose projects to work on and really focus on women who are doing interesting work in the arts that I feel really compelled by. And um, these two images are examples uh, of that kind of work. Um, Goldie Poblador was an artist that I met in residence at Wasaic Project in upstate New York. In my practice as an artist, I have been able to meet artists at that space of being creators in residencies. And so Goldie and I got to know each other and um, she's based here in New York. And she makes a series of these really, really beautiful hand torch, hand blown glass, um, uh, glass pieces that um, are almost the size of shot glasses. But the entire collection of these pieces that she was making by hand had a whole history and a whole story behind them around um, feminist mythologies that relate to the place that she was from. And this was a really important part of the work and a really important part of the object in and of itself. And so I was able to work with Goldie to create a narrative around the roots of this work and her feminist practice and create a narrative to sell these pieces to the public while still maintaining her ideas and her creative impetus as an artist imbued in the way we talk about these, even as objects that we would sell to people to use in their homes. And the other uh, project that you see here is a project called Stotenema, which is a project um, that I was executive produced in 2020 with an artist, um, Aida Stehovic. And Aida's um, project is a uh, nomadic monument that is commemorating the 1995 genocide in Bosnia of 8,000 plus uh, Bosnian Muslim men. And this is a work where we got to engage with a whole range of people internationally and nationally and really think about the impact that artwork can have on the healing process and the remembrance process, both for the communities impacted and for communities of allyship around them that want to support them in that process. And then and I'm gonna finish up with just a few little things about the other ways that I feel really strongly about how I practice quote feminism in the work that I do. And one of those ways is through what I call the field work. I have been um, invited to sit on a variety of selection committees, recommend people for grants, help develop RFP to get artists to do large projects at organizations. Um, and I've also been on many committees to select people for residencies. And in all of this internal work, this quiet work, I feel like part of my role is to bring that voice, uh, the voice of people that are not as represented in these spaces, which are people that look like me and people that are often women. And although um, unlike having an artistic practice where your work is out in public space, for me, this kind of grounding work within our field is really important to give artists like Rotem, to give artists like Anna more space to do the work that they do, and other emerging artists that have important voices, putting them in these spaces, giving them access to these resources. And though it's work that's one artist by a time, one artist at a time often, and can be very slow, I believe really strongly in taking a multi-pronged approach to thinking about the role that activism, feminism, and change play in the art world, not just from the perspective of an artist, but from also from the perspective of art workers who often hold the keys to these resources and access to these spaces that artists want to have. Um, and then speaking, doing things like this, I feel like, you know, we are in a moment right now where there is a real need for us to be able to talk about difficult issues together. And being someone that is in this space and that has done a lot of different kinds of work, it's really important to me that I can invite people into these conversations and be part of them. And this is an image of um, a panel that I did with Sue Haley, who is um, all the way on the left of your screen, and Jasmine. And both of these are women who are curators, educators, and artists who work at the Met and at the Bronx Museum. And the three of us were able to have a conversation conversation, the entire panel conversation was about the experience of women of color in the arts. And we were able to talk about the granular experience of doing the work we do on a day-to-day -day basis. And to me, this is the kind of stuff that 
needs to also be part of the conversation we have around feminism and what we might think of as a new renaissance in the art world that we live and work in. And I think finally, the reason that probably I was invited to be part of this panel or one of the primary reasons was um, my work with Art and Feminism, which is a nonprofit organization that I am now the board chair of. And this work has been really foundational in, in the things that I've been talking about because it has been an opportunity for me and the executive director, who is also a woman of color, to commit our organization to developing a board that is 60% or more female identifying and identifies as a person of color. And we've been doing this work over the last six months. And we believe that this is a foundational transformation for a nonprofit to start at this place and not be course correcting, but actually laying a groundwork that is equitable and inclusive and that promotes the voices of women um, in the development and strategic process from the beginning. Um, and so I will stop there um, because I think we have a lot to talk about. All right, so um, I just wanna make sure that Anna, can we hear you? And Rotem, can we hear you? You can hear me. Yeah, Anna, you say hello? Make sure we can hear you. You're on mute. Okay, uh, Anna, I think you might still be on mute. Oh, there you are. I think maybe we can hear you now. Wonderful. Well, first, thank you both so much. Um, I, had, I have a few set of questions that I prepared that we had talked about, but there are a few things that came up in your presentation, a few words that you all used that I thought maybe we could start with. So um, I was thinking about Rotem in your work, um, right early in your presentation, you talked about ambition as it relates to scale and this idea of embodying a male, that kind of male space in your work, especially coming out of the trajectory that you identify as coming out of in terms of action painting and things like that. Um, and then Anna, one of the words that you used that I thought was really interesting was confrontation. And because so much in your presentation, you were sharing a lot of your drawings with us, which in terms of scale are very intimate and have this kind of almost like gentle feeling to them. But as you're drawn into them, you are confronted with some very real ideas and some really complex things through the imagery that you construct. And it was really interesting to hear you talk about where that inspiration comes from, which is a very personal place. And so for both of you, I wanted, I wanted to kind of open with talking about this idea of ambition and confrontation and kind of the relationship that trauma, right, and resistance and struggle has to the ambitions that we have as women working in the art world, but also has to the work itself and how you both position confront confrontation and the ambition for your work in your process and what you do. And I would love for both of you to maybe talk a little bit about that, a little bit more about that if you can. Anna, do you want to start or should I? I don't know, <laughs> you can start. Okay, I can, you know, I can talk about size and, and ambitions because um, working in the sizes and scale that I'm working with, uh, is not typical. I mean, it's, it's a little bit out of the ordinary for everyone, but even more so for women. And I believe in, I don't know, um, you know, not becoming a poster of something, but to, you know, to, to practice and to show and to be the example by doing. And this is what I do. It's not that I decided that I want to work large just in order to show that I'm you know, I'm feminist, I want to represent women this way or another. It is my passion to work in these scales. But saying that and thinking about what I do, uh, it definitely, um, you know, take, takes my art and put it in a place where it, it, it is an evidence for something. Um, and I think that something is about um, taking position of space and uh, and, you know, not being ashamed or not being uh, shy or not, um, 
not trying to conceal or, or I don't stand behind anything. You know, I'm in the front and it's really important for me to, to be there and to say what I need to say and to show this, I don't know, large and, uh, uh, you know, and, I don't know, um, um, installation that takes over a space. I mean, inviting people over. It's um, it's a statement. It's not only art. It's not only uh, saying something. It's a, it's letting people experience this um, grand um, I don't know, uh, gift I don't know, that I'm, I'm that my art can um, can create. Yeah, um, I, I think that's a really interesting way to. I, I really like that approach of thinking about. Also, you know, this isn't just about the ideas and being a feminist artist, but this is about your own passion it coming from there. And I'm just wondering for you, because you, in your presentation, you reference the trajectory that your work kind of comes from, right? The abstract expression is this very like male egocentric. And do you see, I'm just curious, do you see the work that you do as like an implicit confrontation to that history? or even an explicit confrontation to that history? Um, you know, I, I wouldn't choose confrontation, but it's definitely, I mean, you can see the line that it's coming from there. And I can see, uh, again, it's not, it's not about making a statement uh, per se. It's about creating something new. Um, I think, I hope, maybe it's like the next generation of feminism that you don't need to state everything, that you can just be. Uh, and I think my art is trying just to be there and just to talk for itself and by itself. Uh, so it's, so, you know, of course you can see, you know, both um, men and me and, you know, men artists and women artists, and you can see the line that is coming from both, but, you know, taking it to a new level of, um, you know, I I don't I try not to not to play in this field. I just try to create this field where I think that um, you know it just has a place and this place should be seen. And this is why I what I try to do. Yeah. No. Opinion. Thank you, um, Anna. What are some of the thoughts that you're having about this? Yeah, I I was just uh, yeah. I think uh, I agree with Rotten that I also do when when I do my art. I don't think. Uh, about ambition. <laughs> it's what well, you do it because I do it because I have to. It's uh, it's uh, my ambition towards myself, I think. And it was a big, uh, big thing for me. It's It was to be myself. <laughs> it was a long way till I felt it until I was enough brave mm -hmm. to what I want to speak yeah. was for me uh, my ambition, and uh, and also to be able to confront with uh, with lost. In fact, uh, uh, I was trying a little bit to show, as I showed you two images of my works, uh, my beginning of my presentation. I did them in two thousand six, and then. I started to draw in 2011, and be between that time, I was painting really nicely painted paintings, and I I wanted to suggest something, but I uh, and to make some tension, unrest, some something, but still, uh, most people they they uh, they was. Uh, they didn't saw what I wanted to show, and I was also feeling myself that it's not me actually, but I'm afraid to be myself because when I will show it, I don't know what will happen. <laughs> so that was uh, my way, and that to, to to the confrontation and uh, to real to 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 be. Uh, not too shy and to speak loudly. Yeah, I like that. And that is a really nice segue to, you know, something that the three of us talked about um, and that both of you talked about in your presentations, which is the reference to the body 
in, at many levels in your work, at a physical level, at a metaphorical level. Anna, for you, you talked about it kind of at this very spiritual and personal level, like your work being about a way to kind of express yourself even. And in that expression through your drawing series, the body plays a central role. It's a central figure, but it's also a central symbol in a lot of ways. And I think, Rotem, with your work, what's really interesting to think about is the way that your body has always been very actively engaged in the work, but the positioning of that activation has moved over time from being really thinking about it from a material and process space as action painting and the way that your entire body moves in the process to actually translating that to your figure, actually putting, being on the canvas in some way. And, you know, I would love it if both of you could talk about how you feel about your relationship to the body in your work and why it's important for, you, for that to be part of the work that, that, that you put out in the world. Rotem, do you want to start? Yeah, sure, no problem. <laughs> um, what, I, okay, I, when I think about myself, I still think about myself as an, an abstract painter, which means that I don't consider my body as in most of my, you know, my, my art as the main, um, uh, as the represent, re representation, representational part of, the, of my artwork. I do have some bodies of work which has it, uh, which I admit came just after me too, because it was so intense and so um, it just I just had to, ref uh, to respond to it. And um, so these the mysteries and habitat that came, uh, having putting mostly myself, women in general, and mostly myself at the front of the canvas. It was a little bit of a shock for myself as well, because what is it and, and why do I need to have uh, something so representational on my canvases? Um, and, and I think there was something very, in Habitat, for instance, there was something very um, even emotional for me just to discover the feeling of seeing myself on the canvas and especially in this case, uh, being so connected and related to nature, which I'm working with nature in my practice in my, on my canvases, but I never understood, and I understood by painting how how this relation is actually how how this connection is so important. Uh, but you know, the use of my body in general. Yes, I work on these scales, and I have to have um, you know my body being part of the of the of the painting. I can't you know it's not that just my hand that is painting. It's my whole body that has to go and work and lie on the canvas just in order to get to you know to the middle of it. So it's definitely participating in the project in the process of uh, painting. Um, and then once the, the exhibition is, is installed as the painting is, is installed as an immersive uh, exhibition, then it's me and then everybody who enters the exhibition that actually experiencing their own bodies. So the body is, is kind of a tool for the painting, but it's also part of the, of afterwards, of, of, the, of being part of the exhibition, of experiencing the exhibition. And it allows both me and anybody who's, you know, coming to see to be part of, of, the, of the painting actually, so. Yeah. That's a great framing um, that the body functions as almost a relational object in the work, right? That it's an invitation to other bodies, which is a really amazing way to think about it. And I also like the kind of the, the way that you cited that moment of Me Too being a moment where you felt like you needed, you needed a different expression, right? Yes, and, and, so vividly, yes. Yeah, and that expression was also gave you a new perspective on the on your own work, right? The experience of seeing your body in your work in that way. And for me, someone that's kind of outside of your practice, listening to you talk about your work, <coughs> I think so much about how your body has been so much part of your practice for so long. And that this moment compelled a transition for you as the artist to place that in a more public way. 
Um, so I think that it's really exciting. Thank you for sharing that moment of transition. Um, Anna, do you wanna talk a little bit about this as well? Yes, uh, for me, yes. I, uh, as on the beginning, I showed you on the presentation, I, I was using my body. This is a whole series I show only two of works because there's no time to, but I make the just the positions with the, uh, uh, with the with the animals, so there are also uh, pets uh, painting uh, together with uh, female bodies. And but this that was long ago, and now uh, I uh, I uh, I uh, when I think about some problems, which I, I I'm looking for some pictogram to name uh, emotion, emotional state, or for. Uh, uh, for something which bothers me, I uh, I uh, I ask I, myself how do I feel it, and I feel it always with my body, and uh, and uh, so uh, I uh, draw bodies, but also first the beginning of the creation it's that I I focus on my body and I really want to sense it, and it's so it's like. Uh, like a tool for me also. <laughs> Thank you. I mean, I think, you know, uh, one of the things that in, in your work specifically, Anna, as you were kind of moving through the slides, I realized there is, and you talk about this a little bit, the relationship that your work has to conflict or trauma or internal, some kind of like internal process of kind of understanding yourself, but also understanding yourself in the world. And you mentioned um, this lineage, the lineage of women in Polish culture, right? And you talked about mother, right? Like the Polish mom and that being like an actual trope. And I can very much relate to that being from the Indian diaspora. There's very much like the Indian mom. So I, I understand that. And I'm wondering um, if you could talk a little bit about um, how you see yourself in relation to that. And because and, it seems like you explore that in your work, that your work in some way is a response to kind of identifying yourself and acknowledging the space that you're coming from in a way. And I'm, I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about that because it is definitely something, it seems like you are kind of responding to or the context you're working within. I was always feeling that I, I'm not fitting. <laughs> I was trying to fulfill the role, you know. I was trying to be a great mother, but uh, I was uh, always feeling that uh, I will never succeed <laughs> because I feel anger. It's not so nice. It's it's uh, you know, and that that uh, and that pressure, uh, social pressure, but also from the family, everywhere. Uh, make you uh, uh, make conflict in me also and with my inner needs and uh, with uh, uh, what is real um, actually uh, you you are not supposed to express that this bad feelings but it's not true you have bad and good feelings so let's let's show it uh, to the world that it's not always pink and lovely <laughs> Absolutely. And I think for both of you, I think in both of your work, there is a real sense of intimacy. Um, you know, time you work on a large scale, but there is this intimate connection you make with the canvas because you are surrounded by it. And I think, Anna, in some ways, you take like the complementary approach of thinking about scale and line and kind of these like delicate features that bring someone in. And at the closer you get to it, the more complex things become. And I really like how both of your work functions, right, on this level of intimacy as part of the experience of the work itself. And to me, that is a really important way for us to know ourselves, but also know ourselves in relation to space and in relation to others. So I think that's a really beautiful way to think about the expressions of feminism or identity that kind of unfold in your work. And I'm going to ask one more question. And then Isabella had some questions and she wrote them very 
very well. So I'm actually just going to let her like say them because um, she has a really nice context put together. So I'm going to ask this question, then Isabella will ask hers, and then we will look at some of the questions that people typed in the chat. So my last question to you all is about this idea of a new Renaissance. I mean, we are having this dialogue because we are in a moment, not in a specific area, but globally. And I think in a lot of ways, the pandemic has forced us to think more globally about some of these issues and not just at the most local level, even though we might focus on that because that's where we live. And so really, I just wanted to ask for you all, what does a new Renaissance look like? What does that, what do you imagine that to be? Rotem, you said a few things that I think might point to that, but I would just, we are part of a specific moment. We are part of a specific generation of women working in this field, making work in this space. And we have both an agency that maybe women before us didn't have, but it's clear because we're having this discussion that we also have a responsibility that we're not quite where we wanna be yet. So um, I would just love to hear a little bit from both of you about what you aspire that to be. Yeah, I, I would love to, first I want to say that what you were talking about was really um, inspiring to me because what I found out is that a lot, there are a lot of women in positions in art institutions, but I don't think they are uh, putting the effort to, um, I don't know, to show as many women as men, let's say, or to, to try to even up the numbers. So if I go to your question, I think, you know, in the future or ideally, uh, what we will get uh, through this uh, feminism in art and in general is that, you know, the numbers will talk. And saying that, it means that we will have an equal number of women artists uh, and as men artists in uh, showing in museums and galleries. We will have, you know, the prices of artworks for women and for men will be the same. Um, you know, it, 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 you know it's, it's almost easy to understand how you can measure it because it is kind of measurable. Uh, and I think that, you know, when we will not have to say, um, this is, uh, you know, that this art was made by a women artist or a men artist when the, the definition, it's not about saying that, it's about, um, you know, when you don't need to say it because it is really literally equal, then I think, you know, we made it. I don't know if it will happen in our lifetime, but this is <laughs> definitely something to aspire for. Absolutely, thank you. Anna. Yes, I agree with Rotem, uh, definitely, but also I, uh, I just want to add that I think it's important that we, uh, we uh, as a women, because that we will en encourage each other, we will, uh, we will create a kind of sisterhood, uh, that's, that's, uh, that's, I think, very important, uh, that is what, also what I found out in my gallery in Warsaw, it's, I'm very happy to be represented by this gallery, at, uh, also because of that, because it's a kind of feeling there that uh, we uh, we are not, as a woman, um, um, uh, we are not competitive. I don't know if it's the right word. Yes. Not yeah, that we're not. Yeah. But, but we are... We are together, we are helping each other. We are also exchanging um, the, the idea and working together. I was always uh, appreciating to, uh, to work together. I was working with uh, uh, one uh, Japanese girl, uh, uh, Japanese artist, female artist, and it was a great to exchange uh, art views, but also we get closer. So it was also, I think, uh, very, uh, very um, enriching. I don't know if you can say that you become more uh, rich in the experience. And I think it's also what I've noticed, I don't know if it's global, but uh, here uh, in Poland, what is uh, a lot of, I think it's everywhere, a lot of patriarchal thinking comes from women and uh, and that's uh, so so uh, such a pity so I hope the new renaissance uh, 
uh, will bring uh, all the women more together. Absolutely. That is a huge challenge for, for us to kind of understand that many women are in a situation or feel like they're in situations that they have to adhere to the patriarchy to survive themselves. So I like the idea of moving into a space where we gender isn't something we identi always identify an artist by and a space where uh, women can set their own standards for success and feel like those standards will be recognized and appreciated. So thank you both for that. And I will turn it over to Isabella. Thank you, Shita, very much. Um, and in reference to what you said about the patriarchy and the need for women to have their own stance um, also um, in art history and in our everyday um, reality, the multiple roles that we perform. Um, I have a question. Uh, I have two questions, one for Rotem and, and uh, the other one for Anna. Uh, and the first one is uh, to Rotem, and I'll try to be brief. Uh, so you, um, uh, like you said, you claim the gestural painting method recognized primarily with the American abstract expressionism movement. So the normative Western art historical conventions, uh, which are primarily identified with uh, white men in the post-war uh, World War II um, art historical discourse. And uh, uh, names like um, Mark Rothko, Clifford Still, or Maurice Lewis, which are the, you know, the, the large color fields uh, painters. And even uh, I see reference to the large scale architectural sculptures of Richard Serra, like the installations uh, that you showed in your presentation, uh, the heartfelt event from the lab in Tel Aviv, which I really loved. Um, so these movements were historically defined by the critics and the king makers like Clement Greenberg, and Harold uh, Rosenberg, who widely promoted the male trophy names, but gave less or no voice to the female artists of that movement, like Joan Mitchell or Grace Hartigan, and who are often uh, even innovators um, in this movement, like Helen Frankenthaler, who first uh, developed the stain technique, and uh, which was later adapted by Maurice Lewis and Kenneth Nolan. But uh, Helen was uh, ignored by Greenberg, even though she was part of the social circles. So in this process, very tedious process of uh, rewriting the history to include our voices, women's voices in the trajectory, I, I, I have two part questions. So do you identify with the tradition of the abstract expressionism and uh, the female trajectory with the, of that movement? And why are you drawing from these conventions and how, how do you claim them? To, how do you rework them uh, to make them your own methods? And um, embedding the traces of, of the human body in your body, so um, your presence in them. And um, the second question is just, what does it mean to paint with an open heart? Because I saw that uh, phrase <laughs> a lot when I did research. Yeah, that's a very, uh, yeah. Um, it almost summarizes everything, your question. It's, um, uh, and probably it's possible to answer it in so many ways. Um, uh, in general, you know, I adore some of the abstract expressionists, both uh, men and women artists. Uh, but um, what I, what I am not, uh, but I'm not putting myself in this uh, trajectory of being a female artist that has to be on the side of or not. I'm not, you know, I'm not willing to accept it that I'm, not, you know, that I'm second in line or that I shouldn't be, you know, marching ahead. I do uh, influenced by the techniques, and I'm, I am influenced by the, um, uh, or inspired maybe. Uh, you know, by the art, because the art is 
is amazing. Uh, it, it talks to me and I really, you know, love working in this kind of, uh, uh, you know, I call it control and release. There is something about uh, how much do I need to control and how much do I let it go. And this, on this uh, tension of this, um, uh, of this line, I think my whole art is kind of standing on these, on, on these scales. And, and it's always about, uh, you know, how much do I let it go, which ends up to be better. So maybe it also connects to what Anna was saying about working together and about something that I think, you know, that I do bring as, as, a, uh, as a woman. Um, I don't know, I hope I'm not, I hope I'm saying it correctly, um, that there is uh, some kind of, and, and it will connect also to working with an open heart. It's, a, you know, it's about, you know, doing things not because I'm working towards a specific outcome, not because I want to achieve something um, artistically, something which is uh, contradicting or, or confronting something. It's about creating something new that comes from within. And it's about, um, you know, I'm working in, my, in my, heart, my art, I'm working a lot with humble materials, with uh, plants that was with trimmed vegetation, with uh, plastic that were thrown away with all these uh, things that I'm collecting and I'm kind of sharing my my studio with these uh, materials that become really important in my art. So it's about giving voice to, you know, for myself, but also to all the neglected uh, things. And um, so this is this is about, you know, opening my my art my, my heart to my art and to everything that I'm I'm collaborating with in in my art uh, and uh, and I definitely see the connection uh, to abstract expression is because this is how I'm working I mean there is uh, a work which is um, uh, intuitive and it's uh, and it's uh, you know with my whole body and it's uh, uh, working with the diluted paint, so I'm using and and a lot of the techniques, uh, but in my own way, um, creating something new that hopefully uh, will lead me and my art and feminist art in general uh, to a better place and to a good place uh, and to be shown and perceived and experienced by as many people as possible. I hope it answered the question. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, so it all comes down to your own subjectivity in the end, right? To reclaim, <laughs> this is how you apply it. Um, also, I, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I mean, there is definitely, yeah, this aspect definitely is definitely there. Uh, it, I think it's about opening everything and not, exactly. uh, not be scared of, of what will happen once I open. Um, yeah, I think if I have to, to write bottom line, it's, I think it's about that at the end. Wonderful, thank you so much. And I, um, uh, I also have a question to Anna Ovachewska and I'm gonna try to be brief also, but uh, just going in line with the uh, art historical trajectory and the patriarchy uh, uh, embedded in it. Uh, I have a question uh, in reference to uh, your paintings after the Belcher and after Fragonard from 2020 that you showed. Uh, absolutely captivating um, and um, uh, reworking of the Baroque and Rococo style historically dominated by the uh, patriarchy. As we know, uh, male painters, uh, also Jean-Baptiste Chardin and the others. Um, uh, I wanted to refer to this element of grotesque in your painting and uh, your relationship to these genres uh, that represent this uh, monolithical uh, patriarchal subjectivity. Uh, and uh, since, as we know, since early Renaissance landscape and figurative painting has been um, very much the vehicle for the narrative and the content in, in, in art, um, in, in European Baroque and Rococo, the uh, domestic uh, group scenes were taking place against those landscapes and the narratives were presented as beautiful, harmonious with nature, but they were often taking place in dark chambers of uh, domestic abuse and violence and trauma. 
So would you uh, say more uh, about your relationship with these uh, genres uh, in your painting? Uh, why do you go after them, those, those names and these movements and um, how they evoke or relate to uh, the notions of trauma in your work? Those paintings are really like masterpieces. They are beautiful, <laughs> very well painted. And so they are seducing uh, me and they, I, I knew them from, from my childhood. But I always knew that I will never be uh, so beautiful as all these uh, women uh, with a small feet and uh, so uh, glamour, and uh, I was always feeling that I don't fit to this image, like uh, I sweat, I have a big feet, I'm angry, <laughs> and uh, this is a uh, woman, uh, the, the, uh, the image of women which were perceived as beautiful and Baroque and Rococo uh, paintings on these masterpieces, uh, so, um, uh, in fact, uh, painful. The women are uh, sub, uh, subordinated to a man's needs. And uh, that uh, what was perceived as natural, it costs uh, that you have to give up yourself to be so beautiful. And I'm so angry on that because it's uh, uh, still, it's like uh, promoting this, uh, by uh, this uh, this um, image, uh, it's like promoting a, a violence uh, also, uh, hidden violence, not direct, but uh, but uh, it's like, um, so I, uh, I disagree with that. It, it, it makes me, uh, makes me angry, but also I was in the, in the, and then mean uh, uh, I did a lot of paintings with landscapes. I was I was so uh, in love in uh, in them. So uh, I I saw also the this 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 scenes, uh, and uh, I wanted to uh, to uh, re re uh, re uh, to change them to to show it in my own way uh, to uh, to show the by uh, inverting the colors, uh, showing this uh, black side of these uh, lovely images, that it costs pain, it costs uh, really a lot to fulfill this, uh, this uh, lovely image. And uh, you are uh, left lonely. It's a lot of, uh, all, all, all this, a lot of Baroque paint, uh, paintings, they are about love and uh, mm, a relationship. And I think all those figures are quite lonely. I didn't show it on my presentation, but I, I painted the, also um, a painting uh, uh, consists of three, uh, from three pieces like uh, triptych uh, and um, 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 based on a Fragonard painting uh, meeting. I, I divided in three pieces, uh, like there was this sculpture above, there was the girl and there was man who was adoring her. And uh, for me, uh, all of them, they are so lonely. So I want to show this other side of these images by inverting uh, colors, but by adding some elements from myself, like this lens around or drawing, but still keep it deco very decorative. So still it will be like craft, but then different button. Uh, and I think uh, a lot of violence is uh, happening uh, during the daylight. And so a lot of people don't want to notice it. So it was also like obvious, this is love, this is beautiful, but uh, you, you, you don't ask, uh, is it? So I asked. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Anna. It, 
it's it's uh it's it's really beautiful how the darker undertones are represented by like the simple gesture of inverting the colors thank you and uh we should move to to the questions from the audience right Shita? yes please um so i'm just going to read the question out loud and then ritsam and anai you can respond um the first inquiry I am moved by the scale and uses of color in work by both Anna and Rotem. They read as clear engagements with art history. I am struck by the idea Rotem describes, the goal of being, being allowed to be. Yet women continue to struggle with the right to rule their own body and live in equality with men. My question is, how do large paintings disrupt the path of canonical art? How can we balance the goals of autonomy in our persona and identity with belongings to histories and our communities? <laughs> it's a big question. It is a, it is a big question. Um, look, I don't know if art can solve everything. I don't know if, if by painting in large scale, I can really make differences in the world. Um, you know, as you know, I, I, as I was saying in my presentation, I'm working in both sides. I'm an artist, and for many years, I didn't believe that art, my art, or art should or art could make the difference. I didn't want to take part of it in my art, so I was only uh, doing it through my activism. And then at some point, I figured out for myself that. I cannot take it apart because I'm so into my art and I'm so into my activism. And then I tried to find ways to, to put it together. But, you know, uh, I think eventually it's like piece by piece. And, you know, um, for me, it's like installation by installation or maybe painting by painting and protest by protest. And I think uh, that once we are connected in a way, and I think this kind of panels is definitely doing it because it, it brings up the, the thoughts and ideas and questions and, uh, and, and I don't know, inquiries and, and thoughts about what can be done. It's not, I, I think it's a big process. I, I'm not sure if my art will, you know, I hope it will be just, you know, at least one stone in building this castle of uh, equality that we're hoping for. Um, I don't know. Thank you. I think that, that was a really thoughtful response. Anna, do you want to address this question of uh, the balancing the goals of autonomy as an artist, like your persona and identity with also belonging to a community or like a certain history or lineage? Like, how do you balance those two things? I hope I understood well. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, I, I, I think it's important to talk uh, in, in art what is hidden, what is, uh, that's, 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 that's um, uh, in my opinion, what art should be, uh, that you uh, show the shadows, you show the things, uh, nobody wants to see and uh, you we as an artist we have to uh, look uh, for the way to show it and uh, that's the big challenge and uh, still we have to be honest to ourselves because that's and be uh, authentic I don't know if it's the right word yeah. no I think that's a good word to use uh, authentic yes. it's not always easy to be authentic right yes not uh, yes Perfect. not artificial not yeah. pretending and when you are really honest and uh, when you are with the contact with yourself but also with what's going on you are able to see the and you're sensitive enough you are able to see the things which are uh, don't want to be seen for for most people or for some groups or, or even from 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 yourself sometimes, and it's important to speak it and find a way how to how to do it. That's absolutely, absolutely. Thank you. And that question run was from uh, Yasmin. I'm sorry, I did not say that before. Um, and then it looks like our last question is from Hannah. 
And Hannah says, Anna really struck me with what she said about motherhood as a complex experience. I'd love it if she could address this question. How, as artists, do we reconcile the role of mothering with our work and careers? Are they irre irreconcilable? And I, she asked the question in, and maybe Isabella, you can look at this. She, it's in another language and I thought me, I don't speak that language. So maybe you can look in the chat, Isabella and- So oh, she's her. asking if the, um, if the two roles of an artist and, and um, uh, well, being a professional in the arts in general and um, you know, balancing the different roles of being a mother as well and uh, your professional roles, uh, are those irre irreconcilable? You know? What does it mean irreconcilable? Um, Isabella, uh, Hannah wrote the question in Polish in the chat. So I'm wondering if you could read that out loud. I was always thinking uh, that, uh, that it wouldn't be uh, possible to be an artist and a mother, but I have a big need to become both, and I tried. And uh, I'm not saying it's easy, it's very difficult. <laughs> and uh, it's more difficult than I thought, in fact, but uh, I'm happy to be both and it's possible to, uh, to combine it, but uh, I, I don't know if it would be more easy if I would not, wouldn't be an artist, but some just active woman, I don't know. It's, it's just uh, uh, yeah, a lot of challenges, but uh, to be honest, yes, I was really afraid, especially before I uh, uh, delivered my second son, if I will be uh, still able to, to to be an artist. I was even thinking that I have to give up that. I was feeling so guilty to do art. And uh, my idea was at some point that I will become an accountant. <laughs> Uh, or a graphic design, I was thinking, no, I will not do art, but I couldn't. It was that I, 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 I couldn't. So um, I was, uh, it was not like that, that I was always sure that I will do what I will, what I'm doing now. Uh, but uh, I just was doing it. I was, I was creating, I was doing art because I, I have to. But uh, yes, there are some, uh, some moments which are difficult, but I think they are also difficult for if you are not an artist. Because it's quite confronting uh, to be an artist. Anna, thank you for that response. And I believe Isabella might have one more question on the docket that I can't see, but I just, before she asked that last question, I just wanna to say to Rotam and Anna, I wanna thank you both for being so open and transparent and, and really sharing your personal experience about art making and your relationship to feminism. I think the more open we can be with each other, the more possibilities exist. So I just wanna say thank you to both of you for that. And Isabella, I'll hand it over to you to ask this one last question. So this question is uh, from Tom Heyer. Uh, thank you for joining, Tom. Uh, and uh, Tom is asking, uh, he's fascinated with Anna's work in particular. Uh, the content is very personal, uh, not an overtly grand grandiose political statement, more an expression of a feeling, the visual equivalent of a sigh you are amazingly good at conveying these sensibilities. And uh, what strikes Tom is that they are universally intelligible and impossible to argue with. 
in a way that may not be as true for a direct uh, a political comment. So uh, for Anna or generally uh, more to the panel, do you feel like there is an irony there? The more we speak, the less we communicate, uh, the more personal the expression, the more um, generally like relatable. Um, the, in, that's that's the question. Mm -hmm. So would you? Um, <laughs> there's also a second part of this question, but uh, uh, I I'll ask that later. The more you, uh, the more we speak, the less. Uh, I, I, uh, so the more we speak. Uh, just to, mm -hmm. uh, the more we speak, the less we communicate. The more personal mm -hmm. expression, the more generally relatable. I don't know. I think it depends on so many factors and so many things. I don't know, really. Would you like to think about it a little more? And I'm going to ask the second question that Tom had. Mm -hmm. um, it's uh, it's more simple. Um, it, it's coming back to the notions of motherhood. So uh, you having your kids um, and uh, dealing uh, with the balancing the different roles in your life. And um, have your kids responded at all to the perspective on motherhood that comes through your work, through your art. They don't like my art. <laughs> <laughs> yes, for them it's too difficult. They they would prefer that I would stay, you know, uh, in this paintings that I can hide myself a little bit. But they are two boys, you know, so uh, they have some. Uh, they are too young to appreciate yet. <laughs> no, I, I can understand also from their perspective. It's uh, like, uh, for example, one time I was uh, having a big drawing, a, a big canvas with a lot of small drawings, but my drawings, how they look like, uh, like now. And I hanged it because uh, for a long time I didn't have a studio. I was painting at home. So I, I, I was having this work there. And uh, my older son, he brought some friends. And then when they left, he said, he said, you should hide it somewhere. Because I had to say that, uh, that uh, you did it as an assignment for somebody, that you are not as crazy to do it for yourself. <laughs> so uh, yes, so, so uh, it was long, some time ago, the older one, it's, uh, it's seeing that, yes, it's, it's, uh, he appreciate that. And, uh, and um, but uh, it's not so easy for them to look at that. Uh, young uh, one, it's uh, not, uh, not really, uh, he is, uh, he is astonished how somebody wants to look at that. It's so difficult. <laughs> so it's like that. But I, I, for me, it's it's okay. It's, I understand that. I don't expect to be admired by them. I don't know if I answered the question. Maybe, uh, maybe. But uh, to, to talk also about motherhood and the difficulties, I don't know. I think that that will come some point that we could also discuss it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anna. I think, uh, I mean, the question would be for Tom if, if uh, you answered his question, but- uh, But yes, for the first- uh, I think it was very comprehensive and yeah. expanded. For the first uh, piece of the question, I, I had to think it over. It's um, okay. So maybe, uh, maybe Tom, you can uh, um, we can follow up via email after after Anna thinks about it for a second. Thank you for for, for asking and for being interested. <laughs>
and uh, we have more questions. Uh, please submit questions. Uh, she told there is one last question in the Q&A. Okay, um, this will be our last question because it's almost uh, 6.45 and just, um, yeah. But this is actually a great question to end on. It's from Anna and it is for all three of us. So I think all mm -hmm. three of us can give a response to this. Um, in line with the sentence or the idea, people say behind every great man stands dot, dot, dot. Often the end of that sentence is a woman, right? So the question for us is what or who stands behind every great woman in your opinion? Herself. Herself, that's a great response. I'm sure all of us were thinking that. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I think that uh, um, just relating a little bit what Anna was said, I'm happy to say that I have um, and to this question that I feel that luckily I can feel that my family, my husband and kids do stand me behind me and which is good and just being a little bit also in front of me sometimes it's the balance again of finding ourselves. I think that saying uh, herself is very correct. And I think for us, it's also our fellow friends, uh, women, uh, artists. And I think there is something about the collaboration between us that um, really brings us uh, the power we need in order to move forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I um, something that I think about a lot is how the struggles of the past inspire the struggles of the future and think about like, I'm often inspired by the women that have made it possible for me to do what I'm doing today as a call to action to take that responsibility on for like the young girl that's like 16 or 21 and like, you know, could maybe do more than I can if I, if I take that responsibility seriously. So weirdly, I think obviously herself is a great response, but I think the struggle of other women that came before mm -hmm. us is a grounding and, found, and found foundational thing for any woman, I think, who is thinking consciously about this. Yeah. I have one thing to say, Sheetal, and I completely agree with you. And I will also say that the, that the you know, the young generation, I speak about the generation Z because I have a daughter who's part of that generation and the young women of that generation, I think are extraordinary. And they will also carry forward, you know, aspirations and actions that will hopefully contribute to the development evolution of, you know, women in the future. And I also want to say that I'm, in terms of um, future kind of evolution, I think that the trans movement is extremely important in the feminist discourse. And that's something that I'm very interested in exploring for future, um, future discourse, basically. Well, thank you all so much. Thanks to everybody that joined our panel today and for the great questions. And of course, special thanks to Anna and Ratam. It's really amazing to hear you all speak about your work. Thank and you as well. Thank you. Thank, thank, thank you. Thank you to all. Yes. And to all visitors. I want to also join uh, with thanks to Nathalie. Thank you so much, Natalie, and the whole Residency Unlimited staff for organizing this panel. And um, thanks, special thanks to Lulu Meng and Chena Yoshida for dedicated 24-7 work on, on uh, promotion and communications. And uh, special thanks to Claudia Draber, who also uh, provided a lot of support and uh, great communication promotion. Um, and special thanks to Local 30, and uh, Lohar Projects, Shital, thank you so much for moderating the panel um, and uh, visit the Residency Unlimited website and uh, Polish Culture Institute website and uh, for upcoming programs and follow us on social media. Nathalie, do you have something more to add, Shital?
Thank you so much, Thank everyone, you for everyone. joining. Yes, it was a great pleasure to be here. Thank you.